Bonjour, good afternoon, Kwekwe Kastina. It is a privilege to gather today on the traditional and unceded territory of the Algonquin people here in Ottawa. In doing so, we pay respect to the traditional guardians of this land and acknowledge their long-standing relationship with this territory. Mon nom est Marie-Ève Sylvestre, je suis professeure et doyenne de la Faculté de droit, section de droit civil de l'Université d'Ottawa, et j'ai le très grand honneur d'agir à titre de modératrice pour cette séance d'échange entre l'honorable juge Jamal de la Cour d'appel de l'Ontario et candidat proposé par le premier ministre pour siéger à la Cour suprême du Canada et des membres de la Chambre des communes et du Sénat spécialement réunis pour l'occasion. I want to acknowledge the virtual presence of the Minister of Justice and Attorney General of Canada, the Honorable David Lametti. Je salue également la sous-ministre de la Justice, Madame Nathalie Drouin, ainsi que le commissaire à la magistrature fédérale, Marc Giroux. Before I go any further, I'd like to mention that interpretation is available during this session. You can adjust the settings by clicking on the interpretation icon at the bottom of your screen. You have the choice of either floor, English or French, floor being the default mode. Also a reminder to stay on mute when you're not asked to speak. The Supreme Court of Canada is Canada's final court of appeal. It decides legal issues of the utmost importance for all Canadians in all, any areas of law. La nomination d'un juge à la Cour suprême est un événement très important dans notre démocratie constitutionnelle. Pour citer les propos du regretté Charles Gontier de la Cour suprême du Canada, la fonction judiciaire est tout à fait unique. Notre société confie d'importants pouvoirs et responsabilités aux membres de sa magistrature. J'ajoute que ça est, cela est particulièrement vrai de la Cour suprême du Canada. Cette Cour de dernier ressort est non seulement appelée à trancher des litiges sur des questions d'intérêt national, mais elle est également responsable de protéger l'équilibre des compétences constitutionnelles entre les différents paliers de gouvernement et agit comme gardienne des droits et libertés et des droits de la personne qui sont enchâssés dans la Charte canadienne des droits et libertés. Respectée partout dans le monde, notre Cour suprême est reconnue pour son indépendance et l'excellence de ses juges. Given the important responsibility that lies upon judges of the Supreme Court of Canada, it is crucial that a rigorous process be followed. In this case, the process was launched by the Prime Minister of Canada on February 19, 2021, in the anticipation of the retirement of Madame Justice Rosalie Abella. Justice Abella was appointed to the Supreme Court of Canada from the Court of Appeal of Ontario. In recognition of the Convention of Regional Representation, the process was open to candidates from the province of Ontario. Since 2016, this process involves the creation of an independent and partisan advisory board, whose mandate is to provide a short list of candidates to the Prime Minister for Supreme Court appointments. Cette année, le comité consultatif était présidé par la très honorable Kim Campbell, est composé des membres suivants. Monsieur David Henry, Madame la commissaire Beverly Noel Salmon, la professeure Signa Down Shanks, Maître Jill Perry, l'honorable Louise Charron et la doyenne Erica Chamberlain. The advisory board conducted a careful evaluation of the candidacies based on the criteria released by the prime minister. This long list of criteria includes a superior knowledge of the law superior analytical skills, the ability to resolve complex legal problems, an awareness of and ability to synthesize information about the social context in which legal disputes arise, clarity of thought, an ability to work under significant time pressures in any area of law, a commitment to public irreproachable integrity, respect for others, an ability to appreciate a diversity of views, perspectives, and life experiences, especially in so far as marginalized populations are concerned. Moral courage, discretion, and an open mind that allows for fair and impartial decision-making. Le candidat recherché doit aussi être effectivement bilingue et représenter toute la diversité de notre pays. Après une étude rigoureuse des dossiers, le comité consultatif a remis au premier ministre une liste de candidats et de candidates hautement qualifiés pour cette fonction. 
Le 17 juin dernier, le premier ministre Justin Trudeau a annoncé la nomination de l'honorable Mahmoud Jamal de la Cour d'appel de l'Ontario. Lors d'une audience spéciale qui a eu lieu plus tôt ce matin, le ministre de la Justice et la présidente du comité consultatif ont comparu devant le comité permanent de la justice et des droits de la personne de la Chambre des communes pour discuter du processus de sélection et des motifs de la nomination. Le processus de nomination comporte finalement un forum public d'échange entre le candidat et les parlementaires. C'est l'objet de cette séance cet après-midi. L'objectif de l'exercice dans lequel nous nous lançons consiste à permettre aux parlementaires et de fait à tous les Canadiens et Canadiennes qui nous écoutent aujourd'hui de faire connaissance avec le candidat proposé par le premier ministre d'en apprendre un peu plus sur les expériences professionnelles et personnelles qui ont jalonné son parcours et qui l'ont mené jusqu'ici, et d'ainsi constater qu'il possède toutes les qualités nécessaires qui lui permettront de s'acquitter de ses fonctions à la Cour suprême du Canada. Today's proceedings are to be conducted in the highest tradition of civility, respect and restraint being mindful of the primary importance of the principles of judicial independence and impartiality. While Canadians, through their elected representatives, must be able to participate in democratic decisions, they must also rely on a judiciary that can make decisions free of influence and based on fact and law. Thus, in the exchange that will follow, parliamentarians should not ask the nominee to comment or take position on issues that may be pending or may arise before the Supreme Court so that he is perceived to have a prejudge opinion on such issues. While it is perfectly acceptable to question the nominee on his understanding of the judicial role or the act of judging on, or on how he views the Supreme Court's relationship to the other branches of government, Parliamentarians should refrain from questioning the candidate on his interpretation of specific legislative or regulatory documents, or on hypothetical issues that could be debated before the court, nor should they ask the nominee to comment on previous decision of the Supreme Court, or indeed to comment on or to justify his own past decisions. Likewise, the candidate should not be asked to comment on the nomination process. It is my role to make sure that such rules are respected. J'insiste sur le fait que cette séance ne se transforme pas en un contre-interrogatoire du candidat et qu'il faille éviter de faire le procès de décisions qu'il a rendues dans le passé ou pourrait rendre à l'avenir. Au contraire, j'invite les parlementaires à profiter de cette opportunité extraordinaire qui leur est donnée d'échanger avec le juge Jamal afin d'en apprendre plus sur lui et le rôle qu'il sera appelé à jouer. Si je suis d'avis que l'une des questions posées ne respecte pas le délicat équilibre entre la participation démocratique et l'indépendance judiciaire, j'inviterai les participants à reformuler leurs questions afin de préserver la réserve judiciaire requise par la fonction. Cela veut donc dire que certaines questions ne pourront pas obtenir de réponse ou encore obtiendront une réponse incomplète. Je vous remercie à l'avance de votre collaboration. Now, the session will take place as follows. Justice Jamal will first make an opening statement, approximately 15 minutes. Then I will invite the members of the House of Commons to ask questions following the order which they all agree upon. Please wait until I call your name before speaking. Questions should be addressed through the moderator, that is myself, and I will then ask Justice Jamal to respond. I should mention that this is not a regular meeting of the House of Commons or Senate Standing Committees, and as such, parliamentary privilege does not apply to this special hearing. Parliamentarians will each have a maximum of four minutes to engage into a discussion with Justice Jamal, to be sure four minutes include the questions and the answers. Given the virtual nature of this meeting, we don't have the benefit of a clock, but I'll be responsible for keeping the time. Si la première question et la première réponse laissent encore un peu de temps, la personne pourra poser une deuxième question. Une fois les parlementaires entendus, le candidat sera invité à faire une très courte déclaration de clôture avant que je ne marque la fin de la séance. On m'informe finalement de la tenue d'un vote à la Chambre des communes à 17h30. 
Nous suspendrons donc la séance vers 17h20 pour reprendre ensuite après le vote à 17h45. J'ai maintenant l'immense plaisir de vous présenter l'honorable juge Mahmoud Jamal, candidat proposé par le premier ministre du Canada pour siéger à la Cour suprême. Monsieur le juge. Merci, Madame la doyenne. Mesdames et messieurs, les députés, sénatrices et sénateurs, distingués and invités, thank you for the honor of appearing before you. I understand and respect the legitimate interest that you and Canadians have in knowing about someone who's been nominated to be a justice of the Supreme Court of Canada. I applied for this job, so I'm happy to be here to describe my background and to answer your questions, and I will do so to the fullest extent allowed by my judicial office. Je voudrais faire deux remarques pré préliminaires. Tout d'abord, je tiens à remercier le Premier ministre pour le grand honneur de cette nomination. C'est avec beaucoup d'humilité que j'envisage l'exercice de cette, cette fonction. Je tiens également à remercier tous les membres du comité consultatif, consultatif présidé par le très, très honorable Kim Campbell d'avoir évalué ma candidature dans le cadre de ce qui était, de, de mon point de vue, un processus très rigoureux qu'ils ont abordé avec un sérieux remarquable. Second, I want to say a few words about Justice Rosalie Sibelman Abella, recognizing that these few words cannot do justice to her remarkable career. Justice Abella has served on the Supreme Court of Canada with remarkable distinction for 17 years. She's a legal giant, both in Canada and globally. A child of Holocaust survivors, a refugee, a judge for over 40 years, and the first Jewish woman on the Supreme Court, Her contributions to the law are legion. Anyone who wants to understand the meaning of service, both to the law and to this country, need look no further than her life's work. Dans mes remarques devant vous, je commencerai par vous parler un peu de mon parcours personnel et de mon éducation. Je décrirai ensuite brièvement ma carrière d'avocat et du juge d'appel et, et je commenterai le rôle d'un du, juge de la Cour suprême du Canada. Je terminerai en vous expliquant pourquoi j'ai postulé et ce que j'espère apporter à ce poste si je suis nommé. So let me begin with my personal background and education. My, my family story is shared by so many new Canadians who have moved from country to country in search of a better life. My family were Ismaili Muslims from Gujarat in British India, who had migrated to East Africa during the construction of the railways in the 19th century. Three generations of us were born in Kenya, including me, in 1967. In 1969, my parents immigrated to the UK in the hope of a better life for their children. Growing up in, the, in a small village north of London, I received a pluralistic cultural and religious upbringing with all its identity challenges. I was raised as a, at school as a Christian, reciting the Lord's Prayer and absorbing the values of the Church of England and at home as a Muslim, mem memorizing Arabic prayers from the Quran and living as part of England's Ismaili community. Although I remain a very, prou very proud of my Ismaili Muslim heritage, I became a member of the Baha'i faith when I married my wife, Galetta, who had come to Alberta via the Philippines as a refugee from Iran after fleeing the religious persecution of Baha'is during the Iranian Revolution. We've raised our two sons, Darius and Justin, in Toronto's multi-ethnic Baha'i community, and we're very proud of them both. Darius has just finished his first year at McGill, and Justin is going into grade 12. <coughs> Ma propre famille est arrivée au Canada en novembre 1981. Je pense qu'il est juste de dire que nous avons sauté sur l'occasion de venir ici. Nous nous sommes installés à Edmonton où nous nous sommes immédiatement sentis plus à l'aise que jamais auparavant. J'ai fréquenté l'école secondaire Ross Shepard que son ancien élève le plus célèbre, un certain Wayne Gretzky, venait de délaisser pour se consacrer à la tâche de transformer Edmonton en la ville des champions. My parents who had not attended university themselves always encouraged education. They told me to get an education because an education is something that nobody can ever take away from you. After high school, I studied economics, but ultimately found my home in the law. I spent a year at the London School of Economics before receiving a degree in economics from Trinity College at the University of Toronto. I then moved to Montreal for four years where I studied for degrees in common law and Quebec civil law at the Faculty of Law at McGill University. 
And finally, I received a graduate law degree from Yale Law School, specializing in comparative law, constitutional law, and legal history. Je me compte particulièrement chanceux d'avoir étudié la common law et le droit civil québécois à l'Université McGill. J'ai vécu parmi les Québécois et Québécoises et j'ai épousé la culture du Québec et sa tradition juridique. J'ai considérablement amélioré mon vocabulaire juridique français en apprenant le droit civil, en travaillant pendant deux étés dans un cabinet à Montréal et en occupant le poste d'auxiliaire juridique auprès du juge Melvin Rothman à la Cour d'appel du Québec. Après mes études à la Faculté de droit, j'ai occupé le poste d'auxiliaire juridique auprès d'un autre grand juriste québécois, le juge Charles Gontier de la Cour suprême du Canada. Par ailleurs, tout en étant membre du barreau de l'Ontario, à diverses reprises, j'ai obtenu un permis d'exercice temporaire au Québec pour plaider devant les tribunaux québécois, dans une première instance qu'on appelle. J'ai aussi plaidé devant la Cour suprême du Canada 10 dossiers provenant du Québec. Cette expérience comme avocat plaideur, avec ma formation bilingue et bijuridique, a éveillé en moi une plus grande sensibilité envers la diversité canadienne et la richesse à la fois intellectuelle et culturelle qui en découle. My over 23 years of, as a lawyer was spent at Osla Hoskin and Harcourt in Toronto a law firm whose alumni at that time had included Justice Bertha Wilson, the first woman on the Court of Appeal for Ontario and the first woman on the Supreme Court of Canada. I began practicing law just as the Canadian legal profession was undergoing a profound national integration. The Supreme Court had recently permitted interprovincial law firms and the Federation of Law Societies was about to conclude its interprovincial mobility agreements, both of which greatly facilitated interprovincial practice. For many lawyers including, uh, across Canada, including me, national legal practices were born. Par conséquent, une grande partie de ma pratique se déroulait à l'extérieur de l'Ontario. J'ai eu la chance de plaider devant les tribunaux de sept provinces différentes. Et si on tient compte de mes activi activités comme conférencier appelé à traiter de di divers sujets juridiques, je me compte chanceux et je suis fier d'avoir travaillé dans toutes et chacune des dix provinces du Canada. L'érosion des barrières interprovinciales m'a permis d'apprendre des avocats et des juges de tout le Canada. J'en ai tiré deux choses. D'une part, j'ai une groupe plus grande sensibilité à la spécificité de chaque endroit. D'autre part, j'ai pris conscience des nombreux points qui nous unissent. Ces expériences ont renforcé ma conviction de la diversité et l'unité essentielle de notre pays, de ses peuples et de la profession juridique canadienne. My practice as a lawyer was extremely varied. It included Supreme Court and appellate advocacy, constitutional law, including both charter and division of powers cases, administrative and public law more generally, class actions, criminal and regulatory litigation, as well as cases involving commercial litigation, banking law, competition law, tax law, Aboriginal law, copyright and pension law. I greatly, greatly enjoyed this diversity. Mais le travail que j'aimais le plus, c'était plaider de, devant la Cour suprême. J'ai eu la piqûre pour ce travail en travaillant pour le juge Gontier à la Cour suprême, ce qui m'a donné l'occasion de à l'œuvre des avocats de la trompe d'Ianbeni. Au fil des ans, j'ai eu la chance de comparaître de, comme avocat d'une partie ou d'un intervenant dans 30, 35 appels devant la Cour, dans un large éventail de causes civiles, constitutionnelles, réglementaires et pénales, dont plusieurs portant sur le droit civil québécois. The other part of my practice that I really loved was pro bono work. I think all of us try to find some meaning in our work, and pro bono work certainly did that for me. Such work allows you to transcend day-to-day -day concerns and to join in something much larger than yourself. I came to view vote pro bono work as a way to help people and perhaps to shape the law. And over time, I worked on cases that for foreign trained medical doctors seeking to requalify in Canada, as well as cases that, in, uh, that advance the equality rights of indigenous peoples, civil liberties, access to justice and the rights of children. I also served as the national chair of my firm's pro bono program for many years. 
And I found the mentoring relationships that I developed with young lawyers through this work to be both valuable and fulfilling. Although there was always more to be done, this work made me very proud to be a lawyer. J'ai aussi beaucoup aimé enseigner et écrire sur le droit. J'ai enseigné le droit constitutionnel à McGill pendant une session et plus régulièrement le droit administratif à la faculté de droit Osgood Hall. J'ai également enseigné et continue d'enseigner dans de nombreux programmes de formation continue pour les avocats et les juges. L'enseignement me permet de sortir, de sortir du bureau et de m'impliquer dans la communauté juridique. J'aime aussi la rédaction juridique car je trouve que la meilleure façon d'apprendre une nouvelle matière, c'est ni plus ni moins de s'efforcer d'écrire sur, sur le sujet. So after a long career as, a, as a, a lawyer, I was fortunate to become an appellate judge at the Court of Appeal for Ontario. I've learned through my experience at the Court of Appeal that at this stage of my life, there is no more meaningful way for me to contribute to the law and the pursuit of justice than through public service as a judge. Every judge in Canada knows what an extraordinary privilege and responsibility it is to be entrusted with a judicial role. Every case is consequential, even if not presidential, because it matters to the parties. So I try to approach each case with an open mind and a willingness to listen, both to counsel and to my colleagues. It is always more important to listen than to speak. Comme mes collègues de la Cour d'appel de l'Ontario, je suis appelé à siéger tant en matière civile que criminelle. Notre, notre travail se divise à part égale d'ailleurs entre les affaires civiles et criminelles, ce qui se traduit par plus de 1000 appels au fond et plus de 1000 requêtes chaque année. Étant donné que moins de 2%, 2 des affaires de la Cour sont portées en appel devant la Cour suprême du Canada, pour la plupart, des justiciables, la Cour d'appel constitue l'aboutissement final de leur dossier, d'où l'importance d'accorder à chaque dossier tout le soin qu'il mérite. I have been fortunate to be able to write decisions in a broad range of areas, including constitutional law, criminal law, private law, commercial law, mental health law, family and child protection law, procedural law, and a host of other areas. I love the work at the Court of Appeal and I love working with my colleagues. We learn from each other and we make better decisions as a result. And this is in no small measure due to the leadership of the Chief Justice of Ontario, Chief Justice George Strathy. Le rôle d'un juge de la Cour suprême du Canada est quelque peu différent de celui d'un juge de la Cour d'appel d'une province. La Cour suprême entend moins de dossiers. En temps normal, la Cour suprême entend chaque année environ so, euh, 70 appels en plus de traités, traité, environ 500 demandes d'autorisation provenant de partout au Canada. Mais juste, justement, comme les dossiers sont moins nombreux, les juges de la Cour suprême ont l'obligation d'approfondir les questions, ce qui veut dire non seulement de clarifier le droit pour tous les Canadiens et Canadiennes, mais aussi de s'assurer que l'évolution du droit soit synonyme de justice. The Supreme Court's appeal docket consists of appeals as of right in certain criminal cases, civil, constitutional, and criminal appeals with leave on questions of public importance, and federal and provincial references. As a national institution, the court provides guidance on the law for all of Canada. And like any judge, a judge of the Supreme Court of Canada is a constitutionally mandated referee, to use former Justice Ian Binney's phrase. In this referee role, Judges adjudicate disputes based on the law and based on the evidence before the court and not based on their policy agenda, their religion, or their political views. The Supreme Court waits for cases to come before it and then adjudicates them based on its interpretation of what the law requires. Alors, pourquoi ai-je postulé à la, à la Cour suprême? La réponse simple est que j'aime le droit et j'aime écrire. J'aime beaucoup travailler sur des problèmes juridiques complexes et m'efforcer d'y apporter clarté et ordre. Enfin, tout au long d'une carrière juridique, juridique qui s'est échelonnée sur une trentaine d'années, qui m'a permis de vivre une foule d'expériences et surtout de côtoyer un grand nombre de Canadiens et de Canadiennes 
issu de tous les milieux, j'ai pris conscience de l'importance fondamentale de la primauté du droit et du rôle du juge dans une démocratie constitutionnelle. I would welcome the chance to make a broader contribution to the community and to give back to the country that welcomed my family and that has provided me with so many opportunities. If appointed, I would hope to approach the role with humility and hard work. Former Yale Law School professor, the late Charles Reich, once wrote that when you recognize a moment that is an authentic part of your dream, you have to give it all the passionate belief that it deserves. I believe that that is how Justice Abella approached her role during her 17 years on the Supreme Court of Canada. And it is how I promise to approach mine if appointed. Je vous remercie. Thank you. Thank you very much, Justice Jamal, for uh, those words. It was quite a quote and quite an opening statement. Um, so we now move on to the question period. On commence maintenant la période de questions. And Senator Mobina Jaffer will have the first question. Senator Jaffer. Thank you very much, Madam Moderator. Thank you to the Prime Minister and to the Justice Minister Lametti for such an amazing nomination. The Honorable Justice Jamal, c'est un honor absolu de vous accueillir au Parlement virtuel du Canada. Vos antécédents en tant que juristes sont excellents et votre bilinguisme représente l'avenir du Canada. Je tiens à remercier l'ancienne sénatrice Claudette Tar Tardif pour son travail de nomination de juge bilingue. Vous, juge Justice uh, Jamal, représentez notre diversité et notre avenir. My question to you, Justice Jamal, is being appointed to the Supreme Court seems almost a natural step in what has been a very stellar legal career for you. While your Supreme Court of Canada tenure is only about to begin, have you thought about the legacy of what you would like to leave and how uh, would you consider your own life experiences would impact the way you approach decision making at the Supreme Court of Canada? Merci. Thank you, Senator Justice Jamal. Yes, if you just give me a second, I'll, I'll uh, address that. And uh... so, Senator thank, Jaffa, thank you for the questions. There were several questions there. First of all, in terms of um, this being a natural step, of uh, of course, I'm, I'm. Uh, uh, confronted by, as anybody is who applies to the Supreme Court of Canada, by the statistical improbability of ever being appointed. Um, I would be, if I was appointed, uh, the 88th judge in 146 years. So I don't think with respect that anybody, I'm, I'm humbled and honored to be appointed, but I don't think anybody uh, in this country or any jurist can think it's an inevitable step. I'm, I'm honored, truly honored to have the opportunity, uh, potential opportunity to serve on that court. Um, I'm honored to be nominated, but I don't think I view it as a, a natural step in any way. Um, but I'm obviously enormous to have been nominated. In terms of the legacy, um, it's, a, it's a little early for me to be thinking about that. But what I hope uh, both if, on this court and uh, what, um, uh, as I a judge on this court, what I hope is the most important people in the court are the parties before the court. And what I hope is that they at, uh, on this court, at the Court of Appeal, and certainly uh, if I were uh, so fortunate to be appointed to the Supreme Court, I think what I would hope is that people would say that they, I came into court with an open mind, with a willingness to listen, and that I decided the cases based on the facts and the evidence before the court in light of the law. And that, uh, I even, that even the losing party uh, felt that I had given them a fair shake and that I'd listened to their arguments, that I'd understood their arguments, and that I'd address them. And I, I try to do that every day in my work on the uh, Court of Appeal. I think all my colleagues try to do that. Um, Chance, Vice Chancellor McGarry said that the most important 
person in the courtroom is the losing party. So your reasons have to be persuasive to the losing party. It's easy to write for the winner. It's much harder to write for the losing party and to say you've been heard. So that's what I try to do in a very um, straightforward way every time I try and write a decision. It's to write for the losing party. And I hope that's what people would say. Um, and, it, and that really reflects my approach. One, my approach is to um, not come in with a, with a, dis, a decided view of what the case is, whatever I think, uh, to come in with an open mind, to read the uh, factums, the documents before the court, to read the evidence, to read the record, uh, to come in with an open mind, to listen, genuinely listen to the arguments, to listen to it again after the hearing if I need to, which uh, many of us do as we listen to the digital recordings afterwards, to consult with my colleagues, to listen to my colleagues to what they have to say and then to decide. That's that's uh, my approach to deciding cases. Uh, and in ter terms of the larger development of the law and the jurisprudence, I think it's too early for me to speak about that. But obviously the Supreme Court uh, hears cases of national importance and uh, Every case, almost every case, is an opportunity to develop the law. That is what I love doing. Uh, it is the deep dives into complex questions of law that I love doing. The most satisfying part of legal practice for me is going into a case and seeing confusion, at least for me, uh, you know, a jumble of facts and precedents and confusion, and then gradually seeing the order dissipate as I think through the problem, as I listen to the arguments of the other parties, as I talk to my colleagues, and then as I try to write a decision that is clear, that is accessible, uh, and is, that is as brief as reasonably possible because the parties have to read these decisions and they have to, the, 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 the legal community has to read these decisions. Many self-represented uh, people have to read these decisions. And I think uh, decisions of the Supreme Court and certainly at the Court of Appeal are uh, should be guided by access to justice. They need to be uh, accessible, readable, um, you'll have read in my application, I quoted Chief Justice Dixon on the importance of clear reasons because ordinary Canadians have a right. Uh, we don't write for the legal community. We don't write just for the legal community. We do write for them, of course. But ordinary Canadians have a right to understand what their highest court is saying, what it is deciding, and why it is deciding the way it is and where it fits into the broader legal landscape. So that's what I hope to do. And um, I don't have an agenda. I won't come to the law with an agenda, so I can't say about what I, what legacy I hope to leave. I hope to decide uh, case by case and uh, to take it one case at a time. Thank you, Justice Jamal. We went beyond four minutes, but it, it was a good question and a, and a good answer. So let's uh, now move to Ikra Khalid, MP. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Madam Moderator, and uh, to the Honorable uh, Justice Jamal, I cannot begin to tell you um, how momentous this moment is for myself to see a person like yourself to be in the highest court uh, of our country. And so I, I, I think I'll frame my questions around um, what we've seen over a number of years is uh, really uh, a, a deep dive by, by the Canadian society into um, into civil liberties, into an understanding of, uh, of our human rights uh, and our charter of rights and freedoms and how they complement and, and conflict or, uh, or enhance each other. And I wonder, um, perhaps, uh, Justice, you can help us in understanding a little bit uh, what you think is the role of, um, of education and that continuous education uh, in, uh, within our judiciary across the country, including yourself. And I know that you've participated uh, in several training courses uh, since your appointment to the bench in, in 2019. How important is that education piece in terms of making those sound decisions in understanding that, uh, that social context uh, of the society that we live in, uh, and also just uh, dealing with the realities of uh, technology and, and advancement thereof and how that impacts uh, these decisions. So I, I think I'll, I'll leave it there and see, see where we go with that. Thank you for the question. Um, as you know, this is an issue that's uh, very important for judges. It's actually dealt with in the, addressed in the, uh, the ethical principles for judges. Uh, the principe de déontologie judiciaire. It's an ethical obligation uh, of judges to stay abreast of developments in the law, to stay abreast of social context, and uh, the the ethical principle 
uh, principles talk about professional development being both a formal and an informal, having an informal and a formal aspect. Um, uh, so formal training through the National Judicial Institute or informal training, reading decisions, reading the publications that they send to us. Um, it includes education on social context, uh, issues affecting the administration of justice uh, on the history, heritage and laws relating to indigenous peoples, as well as matters of race, gender, ethnicity, religion, culture, sexual orientation, gender identity and expression. And I'm quoting there from uh, section three of the ethical principles for judges. So this isn't my view. Uh, this is the view of the um, of the judiciary as to what the role of uh, uh, continuing education is. I happen to share that view. Uh, it's been something that I've always done as a lawyer and as a judge, but uh, happily, it's also an ethical obligation uh, for all uh, federally appointed judges in, in Canada, at least. I can only speak to the federally appointed judges. I'm sure it's, it's very similar for the other uh, judges. Um, so I think that's uh, what I would say. And um, uh, I, I, you know, I, I attend as many continuing education programs as I can. Um, I speak as, as many as I can. I like to speak at them because it forces me to do a deep dive into the subject matter. But I also learn a lot from other presenters. And uh, um, I think it's enormously important. And um, happily, um, I think that view is shared amongst all judges. Thank you, Justice Jamal. 30 seconds. Oh, if it's only 30 seconds, I'll just say, uh, Justice Jamal, I'm expecting and uh, hoping to see wonderful things uh, from you and some great decisions uh, that will really uh, unite our country and uh, continue to, for, for us to progress uh, as a nation. Thank you so much and uh, really, really, really honored to, to be here with you today. Thank you. Thank you. We now move to uh, Senator Campbell. Uh, thank you very much, moderator, and uh, uh, thank you for uh, coming before us today, uh, my lord. Um, <clears throat> well, we know that the, the courts are not involved in uh, the political process. Uh, it can be difficult to establish a clear line between law and politics or policy. Um, cases such as Regina versus Carter, and uh, Touchon versus Procureur General du Canada on medical assistance in dying require the courts to make a legal decision about important moral and societal issues. And my question is, in your opinion, has the charter changed the role of the Supreme Court and the line between politics and law? Uh, can we talk about the dialogue between the courts and parliament in such cases? Thank you, Senator. Justice Jamal. Yes, I'll just uh, take, there was a lot in there, so I'll, I'll just take a second if I might. Um, So there was a lot packed into that question, um, Senator Campbell, but uh, certainly um, I don't happen to subscribe to the law, to the view that uh, the courts are engaged in a political exercise. Each branch of government has its has its its role. Uh, the executive has its role. The legislative branch has its role, and the courts have the, its their their role. Uh, in terms of the courts, uh, we are adjudicating. Uh, we've, we first wait, wait for cases to come before us, whereas you um, uh, decide what the, uh, the law should be and you enact the law through a process of legislation. So you have a much broader mandate than the courts. We wait for cases to come before the court and then we decide in accordance with the law. As Justice Corey said in Vreen, we courts uh, wait and then they decide as is their duty. And it was a duty, of course, that was uh, that is imposed in respect to the Charter. It wasn't a, a duty that uh, the courts lobbied for or asked for. It was a duty that was given to them under the Constitution. So that is our role to adjudicate uh, cases. Uh, to use Justice Binney's lovely phrase, uh, courts, judges are constitutionally mandated referees. So we decide on the basis of law, 
not on the basis of public opinion, not on the basis of partisan considerations, not on the basis of views of public policy, but on the basis of law. So when we decide on the basis of law, um, we look to precedent, we look to legal principle, and we look to, to the evidence that's presented in the case, recognizing that we don't have the, the broad uh, array of considerations that you have. We have a very, very focused uh, range of considerations and then decide on the basis of the facts and the evidence having regard to the law. So it's a very different role. And that's why I spoke in my application about the role of judicial modesty. Um, courts have to be mindful that we, that we, we don't have all the facts. We don't have all the data. On the other hand, we have the duty to apply the constitution and to um, fearlessly apply the constitution. That's why we have judicial independence. We don't have to be elected. We don't have to go to the, the ballot box. We, we can decide uh, with judicial independence and decide fearlessly in light of what the constitution requires. So it's this balance, recognizing the limited, uh, the deference that's owed to legislative choices. At the same time, uh, ju judges are the guardians of the constitution, a role given to them by parliament and the people of Canada. So that is the um, different approach to maybe often very, very similar issues. It's to adjudicate on the basis of law, precedent, principle, and the evidence. And then to explain uh, why uh, we adjudicate the way we do. In terms of dialogue, that is obviously a very uh, widespread metaphor that uh, uh, the late uh, Peter Hogg espoused with great uh, brilliance. Uh, a metaphor that courts and legislatures are speaking to each other effectively through their respective roles. And the courts, the legislatures pass law, they say this is what the law is. If a case is brought before the court, the court decides the issue. Uh, it decides on the whether the legislation is constitutional, it decides on the remedy if necessary, it decides what the remedy should be. And that then is, is uh, speaking back to the legislature and then the legislature can decide what it is to do. Um, so that is the dialogue metaphor that you referred to, which I think is a, yes. a very apt way of, and uh, uh, the late Peter, Peter Hogg, as I say, just uh, Professor Peter Hogg, Dean Peter Hogg, um, was a great exponent of that. And I think it's really clarified a lot of our understanding of what the respective roles and responsibility of the courts and the legislatures are. Thank you so much. That was uh, over four minutes. So we'll move to the next uh, question. I'm so, I'm, four I'm, I'm four sorry. minutes goes really fast. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> no, it's all it's all good, Justice Jamal. What I, I I'm suggest maybe what I can suggest is I'm gonna raise my hand whenever okay, sure. four minutes so that it it tells you that it's uh, it's coming. Okay. Um, now we'll hear from uh, Mr. Rob Moore, MP. Thank you to our, our moderator today and uh, Justice uh, Jamal, congratulations on your nomination. It's good to have with us today our uh, Minister of Justice, uh, the Honorable David Lametti as well. Good to see you here, sir. Um, Justice Jamal, you wrote in your uh, submitted questionnaire that, and I think you've just touched on this a bit, but if you could expand on it, that judges should be mindful of the relatively modest role in the process of law reform, they should therefore develop the law cautiously and incrementally, properly leaving major revisions to the legislature wherever possible. And since many of us are in that role as, uh, as members of parliament or senators, uh, I'm wondering if you could um, expand on that thought a bit. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Moore. Thank you, uh, Mr. Moore, and I think uh, to some extent or to a large extent, I've already um, really addressed that question in the previous answer, and I think I was quoting um, former Chief Justice McLaughlin in that particular line. Um, she's somebody I've, I've had, I have tremendous regard to as just about every lawyer and judge does in Canada. So I think it really is a, a question. It's a, It speaks to the um, a, a degree of judicial modesty that, that judges don't have all the information we don't have um, policy studies we don't have um, the all the resources and the op the the broad view that the legislature has when they decide um, uh, uh, questions that ultimately get 
introduced into legislation. Uh, we don't have all that information. We don't have, we don't canvas uh, the uh, electorate uh, and seek their views. We decide on the basis of a case that comes to court with appeal books, with evidence, and that's the four, we stick to the four corners of the record. So that's the, we have um, more limited information about the issue that may be before the court. And we also have um, perhaps less of a breadth of view of the consequences of the decisions that we're making. So that's why I think it's a, it's not my view, it's actually a view that's widely espoused in the in the judiciary that uh, there has to be a degree of deference to legislative choices. Uh, former Chief Justice uh, McLaughlin said that, uh, you know, a, a judge isn't a, um, a to, to quote her, a, a cowboy. It is much more narrow and focused in terms of what the role is. It's not, we're not uh, pursuing a policy agenda when we judge. We have a much more narrow and focused role uh, to decide on the basis of the case with, a, with an appropriate degree of deference to the legislative choices. And what that means is that when you're applying the charter, you don't look for reasons to find unconstitutionality. You have appropriate respect, respect for the, the other branch of government. On the other hand, our duty is to apply the constitution. Our sworn duty is to apply the law. So it is to do so fearlessly where the need arises. Um, so it's that balance that is the role of a judge. I mean, that's the, the issue that confronts a judge uh, any time uh, a constitutional issue arises. It's to have deference to legislative choices, but recognizing it's our duty to apply the constitution and to do, and to do so fearlessly. Uh, judges are independent for that reason. So um, we don't have to be reelected. We don't have to worry about public opinion. Um, we have to look at the law and, and what the constitution requires. So I hope that answered your question. That's great. Thank you and uh, congratulations Thank you. once again. Thank you. Thank you, right on time. Um, now we move to uh, Senator Denise Batters. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. Um, Mr. Justice Jamal, in your Supreme Court questionnaire, I'm going to take this in a similar direction but a slightly different, you state that, quote, um, an essential aspect of a judge's task is to protect the rights of minorities and other historically disadvantaged groups under the Constitution, even when this might not be popular, quote. And some would say that's actually also the role of the Senate. Um, and you also stated in your questionnaire, quote, in discharging this responsibility, a judge is not and must not see be seen to be limiting or hampering the freedom of duly elected legislatures to do their important work, quote. So I'm just wondering, with it in mind that you've already responded to some of this type of question, I'm wondering if you could please elaborate on that. Thank you. Thank you. So I think, thank you very much for the question. Really, you, you've taken two, two quotations from, uh, one from Chief Justice Dixon and the other from Justice Corey, both uh, extraordinary justices on the Supreme Court of Canada. Those, they were in response to a question about the role of a judge in a constitutional democracy. And when I answered that question, I started by saying, I don't start from a blank state slate. Um, I, I do so in the context of a tradition and the tradition is the tradition of the Supreme Court and other justices. So you're asking me for my view of the role of a judge in a constitutional democracy. What I was trying to say is that's well-trodden ground of what the role of a judge is. So uh, what I try to do is answer by saying, this is what uh, uh, Chief Justice uh, Dixon said. It's to protect minorities even when that, under the constitution. It's not to, uh, to do so with a policy agenda. It's to recognize that the role of a in a constitution of a constitution or a written constitution in a constitutional democracy is to protect the rights guaranteed including minority rights um so that was what i was trying to say even when that's unpopular again uh, judicial decisions are sometimes unpopular but our role is to apply the constitution it's not to to be popular um so that was why i uh, referred to the the um uh quotation from um Chief, Chief Just, former Chief Justice Dixon, and um, uh, similarly from Justice uh, uh, Corey. And what I also said in that, in that questionnaire is, this is a role and responsibility that's well established, it's well understood. Uh, and it's a, it's, this framework is one that guides me as in my role. 
It inspires me in what I do, but it also constrains me because it is it, it imposes its own constraints. A judge doesn't have unfettered discretion to do whatever she or he wants. These are constraints imposed by the constitution, by reason, by principle, by the need to get a majority, if a majority and persuade your colleagues if you're going to be writing for the majority. Those are all constraints that apply in the judicial role. So um, that's why I uh, it's a great question that's in the questionnaire, but I, I think it's a question for which there is a an established framework within ju in, within which judges operate. Absolutely, thank you. Um, if I could just have 30 a 30 seconds. Okay, thank you. You indicated that you have testified previously in front of the Senate Legal Committee, and I was wondering if that was the 2003 appearance where you testified about a different Bill C-10 dealt with animal cruelty and firearms, or was there were there any other times that you testified before the Senate Legal Committee? No, that was the that was the uh, uh, instance we were dealing with the bill on animal cruelty, and I was representing uh, some poultry farmers. And uh, 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 Justice Code was also at that uh, committee, and we were dealing with proposed amendments that uh, would eliminate the color of right defense, as I recall. And um, we uh, talked about the um, legal and uh, constitutional implications of that, and whether that was uh, was whether what was being proposed in the bill was consistent with what the uh, stated goal of the uh, the minister was. So that was that was the only instances. It was a great uh, opportunity. I greatly enjoyed it, um, but that, that was the instance. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Monsieur Sénateur Dagenet, vous avez levé votre main? Oui, Madame Sylvestre, vous m'avez donné la parole. C'est-à-dire, c'est pas votre tour, mais est-ce que vous aviez ah. un point d'ordre ou une question? Non, non, en fait, c'est que je voulais poser une question, mais vous me euh, placerez dans la liste. Certainement. Ça ne sera, ça sera pas très long. Merci beaucoup, madame. Uh, our next speaker will be Arif Virani, MP. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, Justice Jamal, let me start by saying I echo your thoughts completely with respect to Justice Abella and her legacy uh, and her contributions to the jurisprudence in respect of equality rights in particular. I'll confess that when I learned of your appointment, uh, Justice Jamal, I was unsurprised and, uh, and delighted. I recall times in the Toronto legal community encountering you at conferences, wondering in, in all candor a bit about uh, the British accent, whether that seemed you, se made you appear to be more formidable. But then I recall actually having cases with you uh, in court and then seeing that intellect on display and how formidable it was. Uh, and I'll also uh, state that we have some commonalities in common in terms of our shared East African ancestry, the fact that we are both from Ismaili Muslim families, that we both, in fact, received Aga Khan Foundation scholarships at McGill. But while, while my list of awards is somewhat more moderate, yours is a couple of pages long, according to your questionnaire, which many of us have read, as you've noticed. But I'll say to you, uh, Justice Jamal, more directly, that your appointment comes with, as a source of pride for South Asian lawyers such as myself. But I wonder if you could reflect on what your appointment means to, to the wider Canadian bar. And what I'm referencing here, Justice Jamal, is for racialized people to see, for the first time ever, among those 88 other appointees in the over 140-year history of this court, for the first time, a racialized person being appointed to the highest appellate court in the land. If you could reflect on what that means to the Canadian bar and to Canadians generally. Thank you, Justice Jamal. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for the uh, questions. Um, so first of all, um, what it is emphatically not about is me. Uh, this is not about me as an individual, uh, as an individual judge. Um, and uh, I recognize that. I recognize that when I was appointed to the Court of Appeal. Um, I think uh, Ms. Campbell mentioned this morning, um, when I was appointed to the Court of Appeal, I was overwhelmed by um, the uh, response of uh, minority lawyers, racialized lawyers of all uh, backgrounds who contacted me and still contact me, um, who um, tell me how important it is to them to uh, see uh, somebody different or other people who are different, because there have been other uh, uh, d different uh, uh, appointees to the Court of Appeal in the last uh, while, including uh, Justice Carosa, a Filipino-Canadian, um, uh, after me. So I think those, and he sits next door to me, 
which is a great uh, treat. So I think uh, I think we're all uh, anybody who is from a um, you know racialized community minority um, is uh, has a you know tremendous responsibility, and so I, I'm very very mindful of that. Uh, I think what I w I've been told and what uh, people say is that they really do see uh, that uh, public institutions are um, open to them. That they have hope that they can see that uh, their own face is reflected in the judiciary. And um, I think it gives them aspiration. I think it gives it engenders trust in public institutions. Um, so whether that's the judiciary, the you know the government's administrative bodies uh, elsewhere, um, obviously, I'm a judge and I'm on a court, so uh, that's my experience. But um, I, I was, as I said, I was overwhelmed by, I didn't expect it to be perfectly honest when I was first appointed to the Court of Appeal. And with this recent uh, uh, nomination, uh, it's really been that experience uh, exponentially. So I'm very, very humbled by that. I'm grateful for the opportunity and uh, I'm aware of the responsibility. I'm very, very mindful of the responsibility that comes with that role. And uh, as I said, I'm gonna do my utmost to uh, discharge it, to, to honor it and to discharge it. Thank you, Justice Shamal. Uh, that ends the four minutes. Uh, the next question comes from Gwen, Senator Gwen Boniface. Thank you, Madam Chair and uh, welcome. Uh, Mr. Justice uh, Jamal, uh, and congratulations. Um, my question really is, um, I, just to be in perspective, I'm from rural Ontario. Um, Chief Justice Wagner has repeatedly spoken out about the need for Canadians with limited legal understanding to have faith in an independent and transparent judiciary. The bulk of your legal experience is being a partner at a, a Bay Street firm. What would you say to assure Canadians that you are not out of touch with problems affecting people, not on Bay Street, but those in all corners uh, across Canada? Thank you, Senator. So, well, Senator, thank you for the questions. Um, as you know, I, I um, spent my career on Bay Street, um, but I didn't. I wasn't of it. I my background was much more modest, uh, uh, and um, uh, as an immigrant, as you know, uh, like so many, it's not just my family. Obviously, so many new Canadians. It's it's a story shared by so many. So it was much more modest um, when I. Um, but I think that instilled in me, I guess, uh, a certain degree of response, feeling a feeling of responsibility to uh, people who didn't have the advantages that I had, and. It was a great platform. I mean, I, I it was a it was a uh, a great job I had. Uh, it was a job. It was where with my where I you know I did my work and got paid and uh, it was what I did. But I also used it as a platform, um, as you can see from all the pro bono work I did. I started doing pro bono work before I um, became a lawyer. I started doing it in law school, some you know significant cases and. Uh, Many of them, you know, looking back, many of them were immigrants uh, and others. Uh, and uh, then I continued doing that pro bono work and I did it really throughout my career. I didn't just do one or two cases in one or two years. I did uh, many, many cases through, uh, you know, the whole 23 years of my uh, career. And those were aiming to use the platform I had to um, advance the interests of people who were more disenfranchised or to protect the civil liberties or Canadians or to um, to, you know, to advance the law, uh, whether it was solicitor client privilege for the Canadian Bar Association, the rights of Indigenous peoples, the rights of children, um, you know, uh, so that was what I tried to do. Um, I tried to stay engaged. I tried to do in different um, roles, um, but my base was obviously on Bay Street, but I also used that base to do other things, uh, but not just once or twice. I, I hope I made it part of who I was. And, um, um, and I didn't really set out to do that, you know, I, it just, that was, that was my, those were things that spoke to me. So, you know, uh, working, I was, as you know, from my questionnaire, I worked on the, um, anti, anti-racism consultation group with many other, um, you know, Ontarians. And, uh, that was something that spoke to me and to spoke to my background. Um, 
I worked as a mentor to recent to, to new immigrants who were trying to get jobs in Canada. I didn't. I, I used the platform that I had. My my what I did is I I met with them. I listened to them. Um, I got their resume. I tried to put it into terms that would be attractive to an employer, and then I deployed my network. I I deployed my Bay Street network to get them interviews. Sometimes to get them jobs, uh, including at my firm. So. Yes, I was on Bay Street, but I tried to use the platform and the networks that I developed because, you know, as I say, I, I yes, I was there my whole career, but it really it wasn't where I came from, and I was very mindful and tried to always remember where I came from and what my responsibilities were to the broader community, and I, I hope to continue to do that. Thank you so much for that. Uh, that uh, we times is, is up, so we now move, Monsieur le député Réal Fortin. Merci, Madame la modératrice. Merci, Monsieur le juge Jamal, d'être avec nous aujourd'hui. Euh, J'ai, comme tous mes collègues, pris connaissance quand même un peu de votre parcours, parcours professionnel, académique, par parcours de vie, je dirais, euh, très impressionnant. J'ai presque envie de vous dire que c'était inutile de prénommer votre fils Justin. Manifestement, vous vous seriez retrouvé un jour à la Cour suprême et... Euh, probablement à notre plus grand bonheur, j'en suis certain, Monsieur le juge. Et euh, j'aimerais, il y a beaucoup de questions que j'aimerais aborder avec vous. En fait, j'aimerais peut-être qu'on prenne à un moment donné du, un moment, prendre une bière, un verre de vin et jaser. Je suis certain que ça pourrait être très long, très bénéfique pour moi. Malheureusement, on n'a que quatre minutes. J'en ai probablement déjà une demi découlée. Alors, je vais me, je, je vais me contenter d'un sujet, Monsieur le juge. Euh, vous êtes, euh, compte tenu de votre parcours, vous, vous êtes conscient de la dualité euh, prédominante au Canada, c'est-à-dire, bon, la communauté canadienne-anglaise, la communauté canadienne-française, vous êtes conscient qu'au Québec, vous avez vécu au Québec, euh, la nation québécoise cherche à, d'une part, survivre au sein de la, de la Fédération canadienne, éventuellement s'épanouir peut-être davantage. Ceci dit, j'aimerais vous entendre sur comment vous percevez le rôle, d'abord, est-ce que la Cour suprême peut jouer un rôle dans euh, la survie et l'épanouissement de la nation québécoise au sein de la Fédération canadienne? Et si oui, comment vous percevez ce rôle, M. le juge? Merci, M. Fortin. Alors, sans euh, se prononcer sur un enjeu spécifique, euh, M. le juge Jamal peut euh, avoir des commentaires généraux sur euh, la dualité linguistique du Canada. Alors, euh, merci pour les, les questions. Euh, premièrement, mon, euh, mon euh, cadet Justin a 17 ans. Il sera très heureux d'être mentionné aujourd'hui. Alors, euh, il euh, regarde ses, euh, ses, euh, ses procédures et il sera très content. Euh, alors, mais, mais votre question plus sérieuse, euh, le rôle du Cour suprême euh, euh, selon la, les, les, les dualité linguistique au, au Canada, je ne peux pas répondre à la question euh, politique euh, du, du Québec comme nation, ça c'est pas mon rôle, c'est votre euh, rôle euh, euh, comme législateur, mais euh, évidemment la Cour suprême a un rôle euh, pour euh, déterminer des, les droits linguistiques et de résoudre les causes qui arrivent devant la Cour et euh, ça c'est un rôle très important, comme j'ai dit euh, auparavant, il faut décider les questions euh, les, les, c'est très important, à mon avis, que les juges soient bilingues. Euh, et euh, comme monsieur le, monsieur, monsieur le juge en chef a déjà mentionné la semaine euh, dernière, mais euh, plusieurs fois, c'est très important que la Cour comme euh, institution nationale, euh, que tous les juges soient bilingues, euh, effectivement bilingues. Euh, alors, ça, ça c'est... Euh, le, 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 je crois que ça, euh, euh, c'est tout ce que je peux, peux dire sur ces questions. Mais le rôle de, de, de la Cour, comme, comme vous savez très bien, euh, est de résoudre les différents qui arrivent à la Cour. Et selon les, les, le, le droit, la Constitution, les précédents, et ça, c'est le rôle euh, du Cour. Et ce n'est pas, pas un rôle de prononcer sur une politique euh, de nation euh, de Québec, Sauf que si c'est euh, dans une loi et la loi est contestée et arrive devant la Cour. Euh, J'espère que ça répond à vos questions. Vos questions. 
Bien, en fait, j'aurais voulu vous entendre sur votre point de vue là-dessus, mais je comprends que ce ne sera pas possible et je respecte ça, M. le juge. Et peut-être rapidement, il reste... Non, merci. Pour... Pardon, oui. votre temps a été coulé, malheureusement. Ah. Ça fait ah. déjà quatre minutes. Merci, M. le juge. Merci. Merci, euh, M. Fortin. Euh, nous passons maintenant au sénateur Claude Carignan. Merci. Euh, ben, bienvenue, M. le juge. Ça nous fait plaisir de vous avoir devant nous. Merci de nous euh, avoir cette opportunité de, 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 nous, de vous présenter euh, aux Canadiens. Euh, ma question porte sur la, sur la religion. Euh, vous avez, lorsque vous avez appliqué pour être juge, vous avez mentionné dans votre euh, document de candidature, et je cite, je suis, de, je suis depuis devenu Bayaï, je ne sais pas si je, le présente, si je le prononce comme il faut, attiré par le message de la foi sur l'unité spirituelle de l'humanité. Et nous élevons nos deux enfants dans la communauté Bayaï multiethnique de Toronto. Donc, je voulais savoir, qu'est-ce qui vous a motivé à parler de votre foi euh, dans un bulletin de candidature pour être euh, juge à la Cour d'appel de l'Ontario? Et euh, est-ce que ce n'est pas un peu délicat de d'avancer votre foi comme ça, alors que vous allez avoir à juger de causes qui touchent la liberté de religion, mais aussi la neutralité de l'État euh, et tout l'aspect de la laïcité devant les tribunaux? Merci, M. le sénateur. Alors, euh, je répondrai à votre, vos questions, euh, sénateur. Il y avait plusieurs questions. Euh, premièrement, euh, euh, les autres juges euh, ont souvent, surtout les juges minoritaires, les juges euh, qui étaient juifs, on, on, tout le monde sait qui étaient les juges juifs à la, à la cour. Euh, et moi, je n'étais ni chrétien ni juif. Euh, je, je croyais que c'était important de, de mentionner euh, ma religion, particulièrement parce que les questions demandées sur le questionnaire, le questionnaire demandaient euh, de, de mon expérience avec la diversité canadienne. Et c'est une partie, ma religion, c'est une partie de mon histoire. J'étais, euh, c'était euh, euh, une partie de, 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 de l'histoire de ma, de ma femme qui a été réfugiée, qui, était, qui a qui devait quitter son pays à cause de la discrimination euh, et, euh, contre les Baha'is euh, dans l'Iran. C'est pourquoi elle, était, est venue, elle, elle, est, elle est allée aux, aux, aux Philippines et, et puis euh, au Canada comme réfugiée. Elle était acceptée très chaleureusement par le Canada. Et c'est pourquoi je l'ai mentionné. Et c'est une partie de qui je suis. Euh, c'est une partie de qui je suis. J'avais cette... Euh, expérience de pluralisme religieux, mais aussi de pluralisme euh, ethnique, de pluralisme national. Euh, J'avais vécu, comme vous savez, en divers euh, pays. Et c'est une partie de, ma, de, de qui je suis. Je suis une, une, un produit de pluralisme, soit religieux, national, et, 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 éthique. Et c'est pourquoi je l'ai mentionné. J'ai aussi, aussi mentionné, parce que je, je l'ai aussi mentionné, euh, parce que autrement il y aura probablement beaucoup de spéculations euh, de quoi je suis et je suis est-ce que je suis euh, ça ou ça et je, je pensais que c'était très important mais c'était très important étant donné la question qui demandait de mes expériences de diversité et de la diversité canadienne j'ai voulu dire que je, je comprends les, les intérêts des minorités religieuses au Canada parce que je suis un minorité religieuse au Canada. Alors, euh, ça, ça ne veut pas dire que ceux qui ne sont pas des minorités religieuses ne peuvent pas comprendre euh, les intérêts des, des minorités religieuses, mais euh, j'espère que ça me donne une, euh, une expérience vécue qui est un peu différente. Alors, c'est ce que j'espère que ça répond à votre, vos questions. Monsieur le sénateur. 
Merci. Si j'ai encore Merci. quelques secondes. Malheureusement, votre temps est écoulé également. On a, on a un juge volubile. Je ne sais pas si les jugements vont être aussi longs que les réponses. <rire> <rire> Merci, M. le sénateur. Merci, M. le juge. Euh, on passe maintenant à Mr. Alice, Alistair McGregor, MP. Uh, thank you so much, moderator. Uh, Justice Jamala, allow me to start by offering my sincere congratulations to you on, on your no nomination to the highest court in our land. Uh, I was able in 2017 to participate uh, with your future colleague, Justice Martin, uh, on her nomination to the high court. And so this is a very unique and special opportunity that we get to, to have a conversation with you. Um, I, uh, I am personally very interested in Indigenous issues in Canada. Um, we live in, in a Canada now, that is now six years past the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's calls to actions, uh, which includes number 45. That touches on the recognition and integration of Indigenous law and legal traditions. Uh, we also live in a Canada that just yesterday saw royal assent given to a bill that will ensure the laws of Canada are consistent with the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, which itself references Indigenous legal traditions and rules, both in Article 4 and in Article 40. My question to you, uh, Justice Jamal, and you know, be as broad as, as, as the constraints allow you to be, uh, I would like to know first, you know, what role do you think judges and the Canadian courts play in advancing reconciliation between non-Indigenous and Indigenous Canadians? And, and secondly, um, what role do you believe uh, Indigenous law and Indigenous legal traditions have uh, as an aspect of Canada's plural justice system? Thank you, Mr. McGregor. Uh, Justice Jamal won't be able to comment on specific bills uh, or statutes, obviously, but he may have some general comments on the issues that you just raised. Thank you. On the, thank you very much for the questions, Mr. McGregor. Um, first on the issue of reconciliation, I think um, reconciliation is all about respect. Um, and I think the call for, recon the, the, the call for reconciliation um, from the Supreme Court is, was made powerfully by former Chief Justice Le Maire in the Delgamuk decision when he said, look, fate, let's face it, we're all here to stay. And that is a call for reconciliation. So I think, um, Obviously, uh, judges, again, I go back, judges decide cases on the law, on the facts uh, and the, the evidence. Certainly, um, they do so in that context where there is a great move uh, quite properly towards reconciliation with uh, the indigenous peoples of Canada, the many indigenous peoples of Canada. So it certainly it is a significant um, animating force, and I'm not saying anything new, as I say, I, that was already declared by former Chief Justice Le Maire in uh, Delgamuk. So that's um, what I see the, in terms of the role of indigenous law, legal traditions and um, UNDRIP, um, obviously the United Nations declaration, I can't speak to, that may well uh, come before the court and the relationship with, between free prior and informed consent and the duty to consult under section 35.1, that may well land before the court. But obviously that's an important um, instrument internationally as a matter of international law and now as a matter of domestic law with the adoption of the, the bill that you mentioned. Um, in terms of the role of um, indigenous law as opposed to Aboriginal uh, uh, Canadian constitutional law, uh, Uh, relating to Aboriginal peoples under under Section 35, what role does Indigenous law have uh, as part of Canadian law? As you know, that's an issue that is being debated in lower courts at the moment, and uh, I'm sure you're familiar with uh, Professor McNeil's uh, excellent recent article, uh, which talked about these two lines of authority are uh, that are per percolating. He obviously has his own view, but that may well be a an issue that arises before the court as to the status of uh, Indigenous law as Canadian law. In terms of Indigenous law more broadly, though, whether uh, it is clearly the law uh, that exists, that is living, 
Uh, it isn't an ancient law, it is a living, breathing law that applies in indigenous communities. I'm not a specialist on indigenous law, but I am, an, I have a strong interest in comparative law. So I have a strong interest in, a, as an amateur in indigenous law, I don't, I don't, I haven't unfortunately ever litigated the issue, taught the issue, um, but I do read. Um, so, you know, works like just uh, John Burroughs' books on Canada's indigenous constitution, I find very instructive in terms of opening one's mind to the, the different sources of indigenous law, because they are very, very different than the sources that we are used to, are those of us who are trained in the common law and the civil law. So looking to issues such as sacred law, natural law, deliberative law, um, other forms of positivistic law and customary law. So, you know, I'm, I draw great uh, inspiration and uh, guidance from experts on indigenous law. Um, recently, uh, the, uh, I'm, a, I'm a member of the board of the Osgood Society for Canadian Legal History. It recently published a book of uh, Heidi Bohaker of the University of Toronto, a historian on the uh, indigenous law of the uh, Anishinaabe, a very, very interesting historical treatise that's, uh, so by working on these other organizations, I get to learn a little bit about uh, uh, Anishinaabe indigenous law and that work. So I'm, you know, I'm looking forward to, these issues may well become before the court and I look forward to, you know, the possibility of studying them and learning about indigenous law by those who actually know a lot more about it than I ever will. Thank, Thank you, you. So Justice Jamal, that we were over time, but that was an important question. So now we move to uh, Senator Brent Cutter. Um, thank you, uh, Madam Chair, Dr. Uh, Dean Sylvester, and thank you for conducting a very elegant and diplomatic uh, chairing of this session. Um, congratulations on a richly deserved nomination, uh, Justice Jamal. Um, you may know, uh, but maybe you don't, that the work that you've done in confidential, confidentiality and privilege in the past is the intellectual backbone for that part of the National Legal Ethics Teaching Casebook for students across the country, and those of us who are involved in that are grateful. Um, and also, I think, as you know, no doubt are aware and probably contributed, the Ontario Court of Appeal had a lot of influence on the shape of the ethical principles for judges to which you referred earlier. And that's really where the first of two questions, if I have the time, takes me. Building on the questions that Mr. McGregor asked, um, you, you referenced portions of the concept of diligence and competence of judges as an ethical principle and including continuing professional development. And I'm, I want to ask you this question specific to what is referred to in ethical principles as becoming more competent and knowledgeable about communities with res respect to which the judge has little or no lived experience. And in the present context of Indigenous people, communities, and governments, that's an important question, I think, for all judges, and I'd like to think for Supreme Court judges and with respect for you. And I'm wondering if you could say a bit more about whether you agree that that's something that judges, including yourself, need to give serious consideration to and maybe expand a bit on how you might achieve that uh, yourself personally. Maybe I could mention the second question if there's time for you to respond. Um, Justice Binney, uh, while he was serving on the court, distinguished uh, courts of appeal where you have been serving as error correcting courts and the Supreme Court of Canada as a policy making court. And I'm wondering if you agree with that assessment and differentiation and how you see that as a challenge and opportunity uh, in the Supreme Court uh, when you will be serving there. Thanks. Thank you, Senator. Uh, for the purposes of time, Justice Jamal, you have a little less than two minutes because we have to suspend the session for the vote. We don't anymore. We don't anymore. Perfect. Thank you. I was not aware. Justice Jamal. So thank you for the questions and thank you for the early remarks. In terms of the um, understanding, um, the lived experience of indigenous peoples, I mean, I, I welcome the opportunity to learn more. I have a little experience um, with that as you've read from my questionnaire when I, um, summer before law school, I uh, worked with the um, Métis Settlements and uh, it was a great job um, because I um, to meet every single uh, Métis Community Council around Alberta and uh, 
um, I got to learn to drive and to drive to the uh, community councils and meet them on on their settlement. Um, that was, and that was an eye opening experience for me because um, it kind of disabused me of a lot of my what started to disabuse me of a lot of my stereotypes. Uh, because I think we all have unconscious biases in some measure, and that was a great experience. I also, as you know, um, from my questionnaire, uh, worked for the um, on a case with uh, uh, on the Congress for the Congress of Aboriginal Peoples on a Section 15 equality case, which allowed me to really under try to learn a little bit about the um, experiences of Indigenous people, particularly urban Indigenous people, and the where you know, 60% of the indigenous people live is in urban areas and some of the challenges that they have and some of the stereotypes that government programs at the time uh, perpetuated. So I have some, little, uh, but obviously I'm welcome to, I'm, I welcome more opportunities to learn. One of the advantages of being a judge is you get invited to speak a lot. And I pretty much never say no when I'm, or I often virtually never say no, because I, I love getting out of the office. I find if you stay in the office too long, you get cabin fever and you can learn by going out and meeting people. So I go and I, so I would love the opportunity to go and meet um, uh, other indigenous people, other indigenous communities. I visited the 10 provinces, but I haven't visited the territories. I hope in this job, I get to, to do that. Um, I would love to. So those are, but I do think, um, that to the extent one can, I mean, I think every judge um, focuses on the ethical principles, uh, which as you know, aren't uh, uh, intended to be binding, but to be intended to be uh, goals. And uh, everybody focuses on them in different ways in terms of what they um, see as an important part of their life. Obviously, um, I, I think that's an important part of uh, my role if, if I'm appointed. So that will be something I will welcome the opportunity to, ex to explore. With respect to your second question um, and the courts of appeal as uh, error correcting and the Supreme Court as policy making, um, I, I'm not one to disagree with Justice Binney, but I, I think I will do so here. Um, I have tremendous regard for him. Um, I think the court of appeal of a province uh, has both error correcting, it is both error correcting in its role and also jurisprudential. Um, the cases that we do are both, they're error correcting and jurisprudential. Uh, they, you, you know, you decide cases on the basis of settled law and you, um, you do deep dives. Uh, you don't have as many deep dives as you have on the Supreme Court, but you do do deep dives and we do do that sort of non-error correcting work here. In terms of whether we, I wouldn't personally use the, wor the word um, policy making I would say more jurisprudential in that they lead to the development of the law. Um, I don't know in what context Justice Binney, uh, for whom I have enormous regard, he's been a mentor to me um, for many, many years um, since um, you know he was the lawyer and uh, I was at the bar and he was at the bar. So I don't know in what context he said that, but um, I would use the word jurisprudential rather than policy making. Thank you very much. Thank you, Justice Jamal. Thank you, Senator Cutter. Uh, we now uh, move to Senator Yvonne Boyer. Thank you, Madam Moderator. I would like to thank you, Justice Jamal, for meeting with us today, and I congratulate you on this nomination. Personally, I am thrilled that you're here, and I'm thrilled about the work you've done in the Métis communities. I have a two-part question that relates to each other. I um, want to ask you about how the Supreme Court of Canada, which has recognized that Indigenous rights have largely been ignored, proposed to represent Indigenous perspectives considering the court's previous guidance on Canada being a tri-jural justice system, as described by Professor John Burroughs. And the second part of my question was asked by MP McGregor, and it had to do with the truth and reconciliation calls to action. And I think you answered it, but if you could weave both of those in, it would be good. Thank you. Could I ask for the first part to be uh, repeated? I didn't quite understand the, um, uh, and pardon me for that. I okay. didn't quite understand the, the uh, first part of the question relating how does, to. How does the Supreme Court of Canada, which has recognized that indigenous rights have largely been ignored, proposed to represent Indigenous perspectives, considering the court's guidance on Canada being a tri-jural justice mm -hmm. system, 
as described by Professor John Burroughs? Well, um, I think in response to that question, um, you know, what, what the court does is, as I said, decide cases that uh, come before it. What it really needs is, is counsel needs counsel to argue those positions and to um, give it the the uh, raw material uh, to address any case. And so whatever the, the court, as I said, doesn't really uh, go off on, on its own agenda, it decides cases and we it decides based on the argument. So, um, you know, it, it really requires lawyers, uh, indigenous lawyers, lawyers uh, steeped in indigenous law to educate the court. Uh, on the various issues and to then that would then lead to uh, adjudication. So I don't know if that answers the, the question. That's the way a court decides the issues. It needs to be educated, it needs to be informed and it needs to have the, case, the right case before it. But again, it then decides not on the basis of an agenda, but based on the evidence and arguments and the material before it. With respect to the um, TRC um, calls to action, I mean, I think it's an enormously important document as a Canadian. I think it's an enormously important document. And I think, uh, um, you know, lawyers, students, um, Canadians generally should read the, uh, the volume that I've read the most is the, the well, the read the, the, is the, the first several hundred page summary model uh, volume. I haven't read all of the, the volumes, but to, to, to read that uh, volume is to be, is to be completely humbled uh, by and to be um, about the the history the history of uh, residential schools and um, you know to understand uh, the experience of indigenous peoples in in Canada. So I think that's and every time I listen to sorry Senator former Senator Murray Sinclair, I mean I'm I'm humbled. Um, you can't but be humbled when you listen to him uh, with his seriousness of purpose and uh, his understanding the depth of his understanding and his humility and his call for reconciliation. So. As a Canadian, that's what I take from that. Um, I'm, you know, deeply inspired by it all. By it all. So, and it's, you know, it's, 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 it's remarkable to think that the last Indigenous school closed in 1996. I mean, that was the year I was called to the bar. It's astonishing. Um, so, um, I hope that answers your questions. I'm, I'm just wondering how you will reconcile and implement the Indigenous rights and the truth and reconciliation calls to action within the work that you'll be doing in the Supreme Court. I agree so with you. We're, we're out of time and uh, I don't think Justice Jamal can answer a question that may arise before the, the Supreme Court. Thank you. Um, so if you'll allow me, we'll move to uh, James Maloney, MP. And just by the way, I'm told that there will be a vote at uh, 6.10. Il y aura un vote à 18h10, donc nous suspendrons la, la session à 18h, 18h05 au plus tard. Uh, so, uh, Mr. Maloney. Thank you, Madam Chair and uh, Justice Jamal. It is uh, truly an honor to be here today participating in this process. Uh, it is a first for me, although I gather it's a first for you as well. Um, just a couple of things out of the gate. One, it's, it's been my long held view that uh, the 1996 call to the bar in Ontario produced some of the finest my country has ever seen. Um, mostly that comes from me. Uh, the, the second thing is I will give your, your children some more airtime because uh, my late father was appointed to the former Supreme Court of Ontario and I spent uh, many a day and weeks roaming the halls of the office you're sitting in right now. So I. Uh, I know what they're going through to some extent. Uh, my questions, uh, sir, are, I was going to ask you uh, how you view the role of the Supreme Court in our democracy, but you've largely addressed that issue. I was going to ask you, um, given the uh, significance of your uh, appointment being the first, uh, how that is important to not the bar association, but to the litigants and to the people uh, who participate in the court process, but are also viewing the court process from afar. Um, I'm going to add to the first question, uh, another additional layer, and that is, we've, we've heard a little bit about the charter and uh, and um, Justice Binney's quote uh, that you referred to you a moment ago, but 
the term judicial activism gets thrown around quite a bit. Personally, I always found that to be a little bit disrespectful to uh, uh, our judges because it's often used in the context when people disagree with uh, what the courts have decided. But uh, I would like your comments on on the, the, the two questions, but in the context of judicial activism. And if there is time for a third question, which there probably won't, I'd be curious to know uh, your thoughts on the appointment process and the uh, application process that you've gone through, recognizing, of course, that you have not been sworn in, so you might be hesitant to answer the question. Thank you, Madam Chair. Exactly, thank you. Um, Mr. Maloney, Justice Jamal. Well, in terms of the, thank you for the questions. In light of the uh, the first question, um, in terms of how it impacts the litigants, um, I think, um, you know, a, a judge has tremendous uh, authority. I mean, it's just no other way of power, authority, whatever you want to call it. Uh, in a criminal case, you're deciding whether somebody goes to jail or not. And in a civil case, you're deciding, uh, uh, you know, who wins in a in a family case, you're deciding may potentially whether in a child protection case, whether a child stays with their uh, parent or not. I mean, those are enormous uh, responsibilities that should engender great humility in the judge. Uh, in terms of the impact on the litigants, though, I think it does um, help uh, trust in public institutions for the litigant to know that there is somebody on the bench or others of the, on the bench who maybe look like them or don't look like everybody else. It's not a simple, uh, you know, a question of having the entire population represented because it isn't possible to do that. But having uh, diversity on the bench when we are a multicultural society as a country uh, is important. And when, you know, in the city of Toronto, when more than half the people are racialized, um, yeah, I think it's important that uh, for people who come before us and who are deciding who are being you know sent to to jail um or ha having their family situation determined i think it's very important for trust in public institutions to know that it isn't uh it's not enough to have that you need still to have good judges and you still need to have um you know decide decisions that are justified in the law and the evidence but i think it does add to trust in public institutions in terms of the um, question about uh, judicial activism, um, I tend to share uh, much of your view that um, you know uh, it is a, an often often a response to a particular result. Um, you know, one can say that not doing something is just as matter, just as much a matter of judicial activism or non-activism if the law and the constitution happen to call for it. So, um, you know, you would have seen no doubt Justice. Uh, Abella's interview uh, with the CBC, and I think that's a that was very very well put, in which where she said that this was sort of really largely uh, a vocabulary that comes from the United States that really doesn't quite fit with our legal culture and our legal experience. I don't believe we have activist judges. I think we have judges who all do their best to respect their oaths, to uh, apply the law and the facts, and uh, don't have agendas, but they happen to reasonably disagree. And that's the nature of our system. Um, there is a plurality of views. So I hope that answers your your question. I don't know what, what was the third Thank question. Maybe it was about the nomination process, but I, oh, uh, gonna, we're, I we're out that. we're out of time, uh, and it's maybe mm -hmm. not an appropriate question. Th Thank uh, you, Justice Jamal. Thank you. Uh, I think I have skipped uh, Mr. Cooper. Um, my apologies, Mr. Mr. Cooper, if I've, I've skipped you. Uh, well, uh, uh, thank, Go you very, ahead. thank you very much, uh, Madam Moderator, and uh, congratulations, Justice Jamal, on your uh, appointment, uh, your CV, and the breadth of your experience in the law is truly impressive. And I have no uh, d doubt that you will be a credit to the Supreme Court and a credit to Canada. Uh, now, I want to ask you a, a, a very broad question uh, regarding uh, international law. Uh, over the last several decades, there have been uh, significant uh, developments uh, in international law, uh, including the establishment of international criminal and trade uh, fora, et cetera. And with that, uh, we have seen uh, a rising use of international law 
in Canadian uh, constitutional litigation. So just in the broadest terms possible, I would be curious as to your thoughts regarding the interplay uh, between uh, principles of constitutional law and international law. Thank you, Mr. Cooper. Well, that's a that's a uh, broad question to respond to in in um, four minutes, but I'll attempt to to do so. First of all, of course, international law that's adopted by uh, legislation, be it federal or provincial, depending on the competence of the relevant level of government that's involved, becomes part of Canadian law. So when that's applied, we're not talking about applying some foreign legal source. We're applying domestic law. Uh, customary uh, law, as you, I know you know, uh, has now been found to be actionable. In the Nevson decision, and so I'm not. That's not my view. That is the majority view of the Supreme Court of Canada. Where I think your question is going is the role of non-binding sources of international law as persuasive authority to lead to the development and articulation of constitutional rights in Canada, and that is an issue. Of course, I cannot address because that is an issue that is hotly debated in the Supreme Court of Canada. Um, I can tell you that uh, uh, I've never had to deal with that issue yet, but my approach to dealing with that issue will be the same approach that I have in respect of every uh, question that will come before me, and that is to read the briefs, read the precedents, read the uh, relevant authorities, to understand the legal framework, to listen to my colleagues, and then to decide the case as best I can. So I don't, what I can commit to you is I don't come in with a predisposition to a particular result because I haven't studied the question. I can't, I don't have an agenda. I really don't have an agenda. So it is on that issue, on that issue, uh, it, I, I can't say what I would do because um, I have to listen to the arguments and uh, uh, you know see what the particular case uh, provides. So I hope that addresses the yes. question. Uh, Thank you, one minute, one minute left. One minute, okay, then I'll th thank you very much, Justice Jamal, for that answer. Uh, in the limited time remaining, perhaps you could just describe what you see as the qualities of a good judge. Well, um, I, I'll speak about the qualities of a good judge at the Supreme Court, because that's uh, the context that we're in. I think you have to love a writing, and you have to be, hopefully, a good writer. Um, because that's uh, what you that's the output of your work. So you have to love writing and you have to be uh, a good writer and willing to continue to learn to write. Firstly, I think you have to have an open mind and the willingness to listen both to the parties and to your colleagues uh, and a willingness to change your mind. I mean, I'm astounded by the number of times I read the briefs, think I know what I'm going to do on a case and then listen to the arguments, listen to my colleagues and change my view. So you have to exercise that uh, capacity that former Chief Justice McLaughlin called conscious objectivity, um, which is to listen, to, to have empathy for each of the parties, to understand their perspectives, and to decide based on the evidence and the facts after you've tried to put your position in their shoes. So having an open mind. I think also collegiality at the Supreme Court is extremely important. You heard this morning about the somewhat cloistered existence of uh, Supreme Court judges. You're, a, you're, a fa you're part of a family of nine. So you have to be collegial, you have to get along with other. That's very, very important. And I'd say lastly, you have to really be willing to work hard. It's a very, very difficult job. I mean, I saw that up close with Justice Gontier. I've seen that with other judges that I've known who've worked at that court. And so you have to be willing to commit to the role and you have to love what you do because uh, if you don't love what you do, it's not a very pleasant um, time uh, on that court. So, and I think everybody who goes to that court loves loves what they do. So I think, uh, I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Thank you, Justice Jamal. Thank you, uh, Mr. Cooper. And again, my apologies for skipping your turn. Uh, Madame la Sénatrice René Dupuis. Je, merci, Madame la modératrice. Je suis désolée, euh, la sourdine refusait d'écouter. 
Merci, euh, Monsieur le juge Jamal, de votre présence aujourd'hui. Euh, vous avez dit, on a rapporté, rapporté vos propos euh, et je cite ce que j'ai lu. Je ne sais pas si ce sont vos propos ou une traduction. Vous me le direz, vous me corrigerez si ce n'est pas le cas. Mais ce qui m'a frappé, c'est que on vous attribuait les propos suivants. Comme beaucoup d'autres, j'ai vécu la discrimination comme un fait de la vie quotidienne. Euh, je voudrais juste commencer par rappeler le fait que si cette séance conjointe avait eu lieu il y a 100 ans, euh, il n'y a aucune femme qui aurait eu l'occasion de vous poser des questions aujourd'hui. Je n'y serais pas. Il n'y a pas de député, il n'y a pas de sénatrice qui y serait. Donc, on s'inscrit dans une évolution d'une société, dans une longue tradition historique. Et ma question porte sur l'article 15 de la Charte canadienne des droits et libertés. Euh, vous le savez mieux que moi, le droit à l'égalité est assuré à tous et à toutes, euh, sans discrimination. Mais ce qui m'intéresse le plus, c'est de savoir comment vous évaluez l'application qui a été faite du paragraphe 2 de cet article-là, où on prévoit que soit des lois, soit des programmes ou des activités peuvent être mises en place, et je cite, euh, donc, pour, qui sont destinés à améliorer la situation d'individus ou de groupes qui ont été défavorisés, défavorisés de toutes sortes de manières, mais notamment euh, par la discrimination. Euh, origine nationale, ethnique, la race, la couleur, la religion. Alors, j'aimerais avoir, et d'autres motifs, là, le sexe, l'âge et les déficiences mentales et physiques, j'aimerais avoir votre, votre analyse de l'application qu'on a fait de cet euh, article-là, donc le paragraphe 2, euh, en termes de ce qu'on appelle en français programme, programme de promotion sociale et peut-être mieux euh, exprimé en anglais, « Affirmative Action Programs ». Merci. Merci, Madame la sénatrice. Le juge Jamal ne pourra pas commenter une disposition spécifique de la Charte canadienne, mais il pourrait certainement revenir sur des propos qu'il a tenus dans son questionnaire. Je veux savoir, en fait, je m'intéresse à savoir quelle est son, sa perspective et quelle est la perspective qu'il apporte dans, euh, la, dans cette possibilité existe en vertu de notre, je ne parle pas d'un cas spécifique, mais en termes de politique publique de ces types de programmes-là, qui visent donc à corriger la discrimination. Oui. Alors, euh, premièrement, c'était mes, mes propos, c'était euh, rédigé en anglais. Alors, euh, ce que je, je parlais de mes expériences euh, dans ce paragraphe euh, en Angleterre, parce que j'étais euh, jeune. Euh, je suis, euh, suis arrivé au, au Canada quand j'avais 14 ans. Alors, je parlais euh, de mes expériences comme, euh, comme euh, enfant et comme euh, euh, jeune euh, en mm -hmm. Angleterre. Et c'était euh, dans les années euh, euh, 70 en Angleterre, il y avait, euh, c'est pas seulement mon, mon expérience, il y avait beaucoup de racisme là à cette euh, époque. Et c'était euh, toujours quand, en, en réponse à la question qui demandait euh, de mes euh, expériences avec euh, la diversité. Et ce que j'ai voulu dire, que c'est une partie de mes expériences. Et je suis arrivé ici, euh, j'avais vécu avec beaucoup de discrimination, comme beaucoup d'autres euh, en Angleterre. Euh, mais je suis arrivé au Canada et c'était tout à fait différent pour moi. Euh, J'accepte qu'il y a beaucoup de discrimination, surtout pour les personnes indigènes, les Noirs, euh, les personnes d'origine euh, asiatique aussi, particulièrement euh, récemment pendant les expériences de COVID-19. J'accepte tout ça, mais j'étais chanceux parce que je, quand je suis arrivé à Edmonton, euh, je, je me sentais tout à fait différent comme en Angleterre. La peur qui était un euh, fait quotidien pour moi, était absente à Edmonton. Alors, c'est sûr que je, je parlais de cette euh, expérience et je crois aussi que c'est une expérience d'une euh, une, une expérience vécue de, 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 encore qui, euh, qui, que j'apporte à, à, à mon, mon, mon rôle comme juge et c'est ça, c'est pourquoi j'ai parlé de ça et c'était une réponse à la question. Um, et vous avez demandé euh, euh, de mon interprétation de l'article 2, euh, de, 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 de 15 euh, 2 de la charte. Euh, évidemment, je ne peux pas répondre à ça, mais je, je peux euh, dire que, avec, comme j'ai dit euh, déjà, euh, j'approche cette euh, tâche euh, avec une, euh, 
euh, respect pour les précédents. Il y a plusieurs, comme vous savez, plusieurs précédents sur cet article. Euh, et je, je, je vais étudier, j'étudierai je, je, je les dossiers, euh, les faits, les circonstances avec les précédents et puis je déciderai euh, selon euh, ce que la, la, la cause euh, demande. Alors, euh, mais je ne peux pas euh, vous donner ici une philosophie euh, de l'article 2, euh, l'article 15.2 de la charte, malheureusement. Merci, euh, Monsieur le juge Jamal. Merci, Madame la sénatrice. Alors, voici la, la situation. Il y a un vote euh, à le, la Chambre des communes à 18h10 et euh, on me dit qu'il y a également un vote à 18h30 au Sénat. Euh, alors, on pourrait euh, ajourner à 18h et reprendre après tous ces votes ou mettre fin à la séance. Maintenant, il me reste neuf participants euh, qui n'ont pas encore eu l'occasion de poser leurs questions. Um, so I'm wondering if we should adjourn or end the session at, uh, at the six. Uh, I, I still have nine participants who have yet to speak and ask their questions. Uh, if I, I can ask each of you to be brief and just as Jamal to be as concise as possible in the answers, perhaps we can get some through. Um, so we have Carolyn Findlay, MP. Merci, merci, Madame la Moderatrice, Honorable Juge Jamal. C'est un grand honneur d'être avec vous à cette réunion aujourd'hui. The nomination of a Supreme Court is of utmost importance and history making, in fact. So uh, we take this process very seriously. Uh, in a past life, I was a civil lit litigator and a family lawyer within that context at times. One of the legal opinions you render discussed in your questionnaire deals with child protection proceedings. Would you care to elaborate on your approach to family law cases that have come before you as a judge where you rightly noted the stakes are very high for the families involved? Yes, well, certainly I can't uh, discuss that particular case, but um, you know, as somebody, um, the, the child protection decision that you sp spoke about and the child protection cases were, some, were really an eye-opener for me because even though I did um, a lot of varied work, I didn't do any family law as a litigator. I did a lot of pro bono work, a lot of charter, but I didn't do any family work. And that was um, enormously humbling uh, work, the, the responsibility to be the, for many um, parents, the final uh, decision maker in, to, in whether their child is placed for adoption or not. I mean, I don't think there's anybody who, uh, as a parent, who can't, under, who wouldn't understand what a tremendous responsibility and humbling role that is. So that was something that I approached with great reverence um, and great, uh, hopefully great humility and, uh, you know, so I would, you know, I, I read the record, I try and read the record um, in every case that I need when I'm writing, uh, but in particularly in the child protection case, I will, I will read the record very, very closely and because you have to get it absolutely right. Um, and so those were cases that were deeply humbling. Family law more generally, again, I didn't practice family law, um, but again, I, I, we, we see a lot of family law at the Court of Appeal and um, those are also um, you know, often very difficult cases. Uh, uh, the Obviously, the more economic uh, family law cases dealing with uh, support issues are more um, easier to do, but the ones that deal with, with custody or um, any number of other issues, whether it's, um, uh, you know, access to the children, those are all things that are, are, um, are often heart-wrenching frankly you you have to be um a stone not to feel uh when you when you're on those sorts of cases so i i they take a lot out i mean they take a lot out of everybody i think they take a lot out of the litigants and the parents who come before us but they certainly and the lawyers as well um but they certainly take a lot out of the judges i think and um could i just ask you uh, you've mentioned mentorship which i think is very important is there a mentor in your life who you would like to acknowledge at this auspicious occasion, someone who has meant a lot to you in your life. In about 45 seconds, please. I mean, there's so many, um, but uh, Edgar Sexton, uh, the late Edgar Sexton, when I was at Osler's, um, Ian Binney, uh, 
Chief Justice Lachlan, she is a mentor, even though she she only appeared before her and got to know her uh, a little, but she was a mentor as an individual. Um, Peter Corey, Justice Peter Corey, who was two doors from down from me when he retired from the bench. Uh, Edward Saunders, who just turned 95 or 96, uh, judge of the Ontario Superior Court. I mean, there's so many um, who've helped me and guided me. Thank you Thank so you. much. Thank, Thank you. you so much, both Ma of you. Uh, Marshall Rothstein. I, I can't not mention Marshall Rothstein. I'm sorry, uh, Marshall. Um, Justice Marshall Rothstein, an enormously important and influential mentor. I mean, I'm going to forget that uh, it's, this isn't the Academy Awards, I guess, but there's so many. Um, <laughs> I've, I've met him and asked his advice. He's a wonderful man. Yes. Okay, thank you both. Uh, la prochaine personne est le sénateur uh, Pierre-Hugues Boisvenu. Est-ce qu'il est présent? Sinon, je passerai la parole à euh, Madame Elisabeth Brière, s'il vous plaît. Thank you, Madame Moderator. Good evening, Justice Jamal. Thank you for being with us and thank you for such an interesting meeting. La confiance en notre système judiciaire est un des fondements de notre société. Le Code de procédure civile du Québec a inclus à son article 18 la règle de la proportionnalité et le Code privilégie également les modes de prévention. Quelle est votre vision quant aux enjeux d'accès à la justice au Canada eu égard au processus judiciaire? Merci pour la question. Merci. Euh, L'accès de justice est très important pour tous les juges. Euh, c'est important maintenant euh, à la Cour d'appel, c'est important pour les, les juges de procès, c'est important pour euh, euh, les juges de la Cour suprême. Euh, les, 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 les enjeux sont euh, divers maintenant pen, euh, pendant la pandémie. L'accès de justice était une, une question très importante d'avoir, de continuer pour les cours, de continuer de fonctionner dans une pandémie. Nous l'avons fait. Je suis fier que notre cours et tous les cours ont continué à donner l'accès à la justice, soit justiciable. Et, mais l'accès de justice a beaucoup de dimensions. C'est, comme j'ai dit, déjà euh, dit, euh, euh, quand on rédige un jugement, c'est un événement d'accès à la justice parce qu'on doit rédiger de façon claire pour les justiciables, pour les, les personnes qui représentent eux-mêmes euh, dans l'avenir. Et... Alors, il y a beaucoup de dimensions euh, de l'accès à la justice. Les, les juges ont leur propre rôle euh, à l'accès à la justice. Le, le barreau a un rôle et le gouvernement aussi a un rôle. Alors, tous les, les participants dans, dans le système de justice ont des rôles très importants euh, dans l'accès à la justice, y, y compris les juges. Merci, euh, Madame la députée Briard. Vous avez toujours deux minutes. I can share my time. Parfait, merci, c'est apprécié. Uh, nous passons uh, à l'actrice Paula Simons. Merci, Madame la Présidente. And I'm very pleased and proud to be speaking to you from Treaty 6 territory. And pleased and proud to say that, like uh, Justice Jamal, I am also a proud graduate of Ross Shepard Composite High School. I would have been there at the same time as you, although I am a couple of years older. So I would have been in grade 12 when you were in grade 10. But I wanted to speak to you in your in your questionnaire and in interviews you've given, you've spoken about some of the challenges your family faced when you came to Edmonton. And I'm gratified to hear that the racism you faced was much less than it had been in England. But I know that your family struggled when they came, that your parents started a, a small business, a restaurant that failed. Um, I know that you've also spoken in your in your questionnaire about the excellence of some of the teaching you received as a high school student. And I wondered if I could ask you to reflect on the way some of those coming of age experiences, both in high school and university, shaped your personal values. And if I can, can use an officious sort of term, your intellectual praxis. Can you tell me how those experiences shaped the person you are as well as the judge you are today? Thank you so much, Senator. Before Justice Jamal answer, I am told that we absolutely have to stop at six because there are two votes going on, one in the House at 6.10 and one in the Senate later. So the session will have to uh, stop and we won't come back because the two hours will have been used. Uh, so Justice Jamal, you may, as you answer your question, uh, say a few words of uh, conclusion as well. Well, thank you very much and congratulations on also being a Rush Shep uh, graduate. Um, so, I mean, 
it, it uh, the day I arrived in Edmonton and was, was at school, I looked around and there were all these different people from different backgrounds and they're all getting along. And I thought, hey, this is a, an extraordinary place. I mean, so can, the, the Canadian immigrant experience is shared by so many uh, Canadians. It's shared by my family and by so many others. So that shaped my approach to Canada. I thought this is an extraordinary country. Um, high school was also where I got to learn French. Rush Shepherd was where I learned French. I had great, great teachers. And uh, Mr. White, I don't know if you remember him, but he was my French teacher. And uh, that I didn't think at the my, time. Mine too. Well, there you go. There you go. I didn't think at the time that it was going to help me uh, in my legal career, but it was enormously beneficial to have such a great French teacher who laid the foundation for everything else that followed. So um, my intellectual practice, it was the foundation of everything. Thank you, uh, Justice Jamal. Um, so we only have two minutes left. I apologize for those of you who won't have the opportunity to ask a question to Justice Jamal. Uh, but I want to thank you all for uh, being so respectful of, of the process today and for your very insightful questions. Uh, Justice Jamal, you uh, may address uh, us for a few words in, in conclusion. I see there are some questions by uh, Mr. Sarai and Ms. Khalid. Is this a uh, point of order? Uh, yes, it would be a point of order. I think we have uh, 10 minutes and if we could ask uh, the last remaining questions and all of us have remote abilities to vote, it would be uh, fair for the last remaining uh, members on both committees to be able to ask some questions, even if it's a shorter time period. Ms. Kellett, I'm, I'm assuming it's the same intervention? The same intervention, yes, absolutely. I know my members were very, very looking forward to, to asking their questions today. Okay. Uh, so let's uh, let's use those, uh, let's say, uh, six or seven minutes left, and then uh, we'll, uh, we'll make it, we'll close it. So um, where were we? Ms. Finlay, were you done with your questions? No, I'm sorry, uh, yeah, Senator sorry. Simon. Had my turn. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, sorry. No, I mean, I, I, I would love to have more time, but I think it would be swinish of me to hog it, and I think we should uh, pass to other people. Great. Thank you so much. So, uh, Mr. Lewis. If Mr. Lewis is not here, perfect. Uh, Senator Dajne, Mr. Senator Dajne. Senator Dajnen nous a quitté. Uh, so, Mr. Sarai, your turn. Thank you, moderator. Uh, um, as the son of immigrants, a person of color, and a lawyer, uh, I want to say, uh, uh, Justice Jamal, it's uh, great to see you here today. Um, I was reminiscing when I grew up uh, uh, as a son of immigrants, uh, parents always told me I have to work 20% harder than everyone else to get the same position. And uh, I'm sure your parents told you the same, but you didn't get the memo right. Seems like you did 200% better than everyone else to be at where you're at today. And I wanna commend you for that. I wanna first ask you, how does it feel? How does it feel to be the 88th uh, Supreme Court Justice nominee in this country? And what is your advice to those Canadians from diverse backgrounds, immigrants, racialized Canadians, members of the LGBT community, community and how they can pursue their dreams in Canada? Uh, in respect to the first part, feel, to be perfectly honest, it doesn't feel real yet. And uh, I'm humbled um, and uh, um, extraordinarily, if, if, I, if I'm appointed, it would be an extraordinary privilege to discharge that role. So that's really, it, it doesn't feel this has happened so quickly and it hasn't felt real. And it, it, it was so statistically improbable that uh, it hasn't really sunk in yet. I don't think it, it will for a, a while if I'm appointed. In terms of my advice to um, uh, other Canadians, uh, young Canadians watching this, um, it's just to to um, to work hard and to believe in yourself and just, um, you know, don't believe people who tell you you can't do something, just work hard and uh, be be, um, uh, be determined and um, and that remember that this is an extraordinarily uh, great country. This is the greatest country in the world. And uh, so that's what I would say. 
uh, what drew you to submit your application to become a Supreme Court judge? And what would your advice be to uh, women or uh, racialized minorities that live perhaps outside Street, House Street, uh, courthouses, uh, practice in suburban areas, rural areas. Uh, how do they? Uh, how are they able to make that mark? Get the references they need in order uh, to be appointed to the bench. And what would be your advice uh, uh, to them? Well, what led me to submit my application was that, as I um, said, I, I spent my whole career uh, litigating in the Supreme Court. I'd worked for the for a judge at the Supreme Court, it was something that I thought, wow, that would be an amazing job one day. And uh, so um, I, I was lucky enough to be appointed here. Um, I applied and uh, um, so I'm very, very fortunate to have this, potentially have this opportunity in terms of, um, you know, those who don't um, work on Bay Street. I think uh, the most important thing I would say is just do what you love, and uh, whether that and get it get involved outside the office. I think whatever you do, getting involved outside the office, getting involved in pro bono work, writing, uh, it will just make you a better lawyer and a better person. Um, I always say, you know, lawyers get cabin fever. If all you do is bill hours for your clients, you will get cabin fever, and you won't be as good a lawyer, and you won't meet as many people, and you won't be able to make as bigger contribution. So I'd say get out of the office and get involved. And if time permits, I'd like to ask, how do you feel that the diversity in your perspective and your, from your background will help you uh, as a Supreme Court justice? 30 seconds. I think everybody brings their own um, experience to the role. And uh, my experience is, is no better and no worse than anybody else's. It's my experience. So I will bring that to the role. My um, other colleagues bring their experiences and it's all different. And that's the, the great thing about Canada is we've got such an extraordinary range of people of different uh, speaking different languages, different cultures, different uh, ethnic backgrounds. And so everybody brings their own experience. Thank you. Thank you, Justice Jamal. Thank you, Mr. Sarai. I'm, I'm happy we got those questions in. Uh, and our last participant is uh, Mr. Mike. Uh, thank you, moderator. And it's an honor to be here today to, to, to get to know our, our newest Supreme Court nominee and uh, uh, Justice Jamal. Uh, this this is a this is a heavy moment, a great moment for 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 all Canadians. And I have to say, as a son of a coal miner, talking to a Supreme Court uh, nominee, it's an, it, it is one of uh, the amazing countries in the world. So I'll be very quick. Uh, most of my colleagues here today have a background in law, and we of course all want to to know more about. Your, nom your, your legal background as a nominee and what makes you the best candidate for the job. But unlike my colleagues, I, I don't have a background in law. And most of my work uh, during my, my career has been in education, youth development and leadership development. And some of the things that you've said today um, really highlights leadership around humility and continuous learning, which speaks to curiosity. And you talked a lot about pro bono, and that speaks to servant leadership. So I, I want you to take this time just to, to tell me and tell us and tell Canadians a little bit more about your leadership style and how will you apply it to this new role? Well, uh, I don't really consider myself as having a leadership style, to be perfectly honest. I, I um, uh, approach uh, every uh, task by just studying, uh, learning as much as I can. Um, I think I learned as a litigator that uh, the the best way to deal with your fears is to prepare. And that means just reading and reading and learning and speaking and uh, taking in as much information as you can. Um, so I think that is what it is. It's to be prepared and to learn as much as you can from and whether that's from, and you can learn from everybody. It doesn't have to be um, from books. It can be from people asking about their experiences. I would say, don't be shy about reaching out to people. Um, I'm, I'm extremely gratified that many of the uh, minority racialized lawyers that contact me, they aren't shy. I tell them not to be shy. They contact me and they say, tell me what I need to do or what, what and I, that's what they should be doing. They should be reaching out to people and people who've been given great uh, opportunities by Canada uh, have great responsibilities to give back. So I think people shouldn't be shy. And I think that's great. Uh, so um, people 
and not everybody will respond, but some will. And so that's what I would say is just get absorb as much information from as many different sources and as many different people, and it will just make you better. Uh, thank you, moderator. And I, I would just end by saying, I, I would disagree with you, sir. I think you do have a leadership style, and I think it's pretty evident uh, through this conversation and your body of work. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Calloway. Uh, Justice Jamal, uh, would you like to address a, a few words to end this session? Merci. Uh, je voudrais juste remercier uh, vous, Madame la Doyenne, d'avoir animé cette session. Je tiens également à vous remercier encore une fois, toutes les membres, de m'avoir fait l'honneur de me permettre de vous pr de présenter, de me présenter devant vous. C'était un grand honneur et je vous remercie. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur le juge. Ça fut un plaisir pour moi de modérer cette session. Désolé qu'on ait été si pressé dans le temps euh, vers la fin. Donc, euh, merci. Euh, je pense qu'on est tous très conscients du moment historique euh, auquel on a assisté. Donc, merci, Monsieur le juge, et félicitations pour votre nomination. Merci beaucoup.